Hello everybody, my name is Toby and I'm a tutor with Tutor Impact UK. Welcome to this demonstration lesson where we're going to discuss who we are. We'll be talking about our strengths, our weaknesses and the attitudes that we have towards ourselves and how we talk to ourselves. So you can follow along to this lesson at home by yourself or preferably with one other person. So let's get into the lesson. Today we have two learning objectives. Firstly, this is to increase a feeling of acceptance towards ourselves. And secondly, to identify negative thought patterns and promote positive self-talk. And these two learning objectives really are intertwined. You can't have one of them without the other, really. Um, so, and there's also a little picture which you can have a little bit of a look at on the right here and um, these are some of the benefits of establishing um, good habits in terms of how we talk to ourselves talking talking to yourself kindly learning to forgive yourself for your shortcomings and that kind of thing so the first concept we're going to be discussing is that everybody is unique so this means that we have different strengths and different weaknesses. No two people are exactly the same. And I think uh, a good way to illustrate this point um, or something that embodies this point um, are the Seven Dwarves from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which is uh, a famous Disney film. Um, so there were, there were seven dwarves that lived with this princess called Snow White. And they were all named after their predominant characteristic. So there was one dwarf called Grumpy, um, who was Grumpy. Uh, another dwarf called Dopey, uh, which means he was unaware, mindless, a bit stupid maybe. Doc, so Doc is clever, but he mixes up his words a lot, so he's always stumbling over his words. Uh, number four, Happy. And there's Bashful, which uh, means shy or timid. Sneezy, maybe Sneezy gets sick a lot or has lots of allergies. And then there's Sleepy, and he likes to sleep because he's tired a lot. So the first activity of today's lesson is an acting game in which you will have to act one of the seven dwarves. Um, so you need to do this with at least one other person. Um, but the way it works is that you take turns to act and whoever is not acting at the time can guess which dwarf it is uh, you're acting. So you would pick a dwarf um, and act them out using words if you'd like to, but without saying the name of the dwarf. Um, yeah, and the other people have to guess which dwarf it is. And perhaps once you've gone through all seven of the, dwar of the dwarfs using using words, um, you can then act with just actions and see if if your partner can guess the dwarf you're acting um, yeah, based on just your movements, where you're trying to capture the predominant characteristic of that dwarf. So for example, if I was trying to act you know, the dwarf happy, I could do this. Like, yeah, so I'm strolling around all jolly big smile on my face, it's quite obvious that I'm that I'm happy. Maybe if I was uh, going to act out. Well, I won't give you any more ideas, actually. Um, at this point, you can pause the video and have a go at this activity, and you can make it progressively harder. So you can use words at the start, uh, but then move on to perhaps just using actions, and then shorten, after that, you could then shorten the, the acting window so you only have three seconds to act out the dwarf. Um, so yeah, this should be quite a fun, uh, a fun little game, and yeah, you can become familiar with the different characteristics that these dwarves are um, embodying. Now, all of the dwarves that you've just acted out are all obviously different from one another, and just like the dwarves in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, um, we are all different from one another as well. And sometimes when we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see. And that's because we're comparing ourselves to others or an imagined version of ourselves. 
So one of the consequences of us all being different is that there's all of these people around you who might be better at certain things or you think that they have better qualities than you do. And so this can make you this can make you feel bad. And you think that when you look in the mirror, or when you think about yourself, that you're not good enough because you're seeing all of these other people around you that might be really good at certain things. And so yeah, when we compare ourselves to others, um, this can make us feel quite negative um, and it can cause feelings of jealousy, feelings of sadness because we don't feel like we're good enough. And these negative feelings can lead us to act in quite a bad way, in quite a nasty way, and it's a way that can hurt others. Um, so these pictures that I put on the slide here are from a film called Cinderella. It's a Disney film. And these are the two ugly stepsisters. And this is Cinderella. And the stepsisters were always so mean to Cinderella because they thought that Cinderella, were, Cinderella was prettier than they were. Um, they were, yeah, they were jealous of, of how pretty she was and so were mean to her because they wanted what she had. Um, so yeah, uh, comparing ourselves to others can lead to negativity and um, can make us feel bad and make us act badly. Now we're going to imagine a scenario uh, with our seven dwarves again, and we're going to think that, um, we're going to think about why these seven dwarves, you know, being seven very different people, why they might have reasons to be jealous of one another. Um, and it's interesting because you'll see that all seven dwarves will be jealous of each other for one reason or another. There's not one dwarf that is you know, clearly the best. Um, although you could make arguments for, su for sure. Um, but this is just a, a hypothetical exercise that just gets us to think about you know, the, the nature of jealousy um, and, and why it actually comes about. So I'll show you some questions on the screen, four questions, just like this. So why might Grumpy be jealous of Happy? And you can pause the video and take time to discuss the answer amongst yourselves, or if you're on your own, just think about your answer and write it down. And then come back to the video and I will give you my opinion on why I think um, Grumpy might be jealous of Happy in this case. So I think you can come up with some quite obvious reasons uh, for this first um, question where Grumpy is jealous of Happy, um, simply because feeling grumpy just isn't very nice. Um, you know, grumpy is going to be moody, he's going to be angry, he's going to snap at people and not say nice things, and so might not be very well liked. Um, but happy, he'll always be positive and upbeat and friendly around people because he's feeling good. So grumpy might be jealous of happy because um, he looks at happy and thinks, wow, he just feels good all the time and I, I'm nearly always grumpy and I wish I wasn't so grumpy. So he would be jealous or envious. Um, secondly, why might Bashful be jealous of Grumpy? Well, chances are Grumpy gets angry and he and he snaps at people um, and, and he you know he tells them when they're annoying him. He says, "I'll oh, stop doing that. That's really annoying me." You know, like a grumpy person sometimes does. Um, but Bashful, he's very shy um, and and timid and might not always have the courage to say what's on his mind. Um, so Bashful might look at Grumpy and think. Well, I wish I was brave enough to say what I'm really thinking. Why might Sleepy be jealous of Bashful? So Bashful is, you know, he's slightly anxious, slightly timid, slightly shy. Um, but usually, you know, when you're feeling when you're feeling anxious, there's also quite a lot of energy there because the line between feeling anxious and feeling excited is very thin. It's like you're on a roller coaster. You know, chances are you're really excited, but you're also quite anxious. So bashful, he's probably quite energetic, and sleepy, who is tired all the time and you know is always nodding off to sleep, might look at bashful and think, "Wow, I wish I wish I had all of this energy that he has." 
And now this last question is a little bit harder, might require some creative thinking. And I don't know if you'll agree with my reasoning, but hear me out. So why might happy be jealous of sleepy? Well, so happy if he feels upbeat um, and happy all the time, but th you know, th this is almost not natural. Um, we all have our highs and lows and the people around us sometimes get sad or frustrated and they're facing challenges of the challenges of everyday life, which can sometimes get them down. Um, and sleepy, he faces this continual challenge of you know, not really having very much energy. Um, so sleepy will probably be able to relate to the struggle of other people. If other dwarves come to him with a problem and say, I'm really struggling with this, it's making me feel down, then sleepy might be able to talk to him about it and empathize with them. But happy just feels happy all the time. And he might not be able to relate to the other dwarves when they come to him with problems. And so this might make him feel a little bit disconnected and like he can't really understand them. Um, so yeah, Happy would look at Sleepy and say, well, you know, Sleepy understands the other dwarves better than I do in some ways. And so the final thing I'll say about this um, you know, hypothetical scenario where all of the dwarves are jealous of each other is just to point out that, okay, so Grumpy is jealous of Happy, but Happy is jealous of Sleepy. But Sleepy is jealous of Bashful, but Bashful is jealous of Grumpy, who's jealous of Happy. And it's a continual loop. No, all of these people, all of these dwarves feel like they are lacking something. They feel like there's something missing in their lives. And that's how we can be. We can feel like, oh, we're not good enough. We could be better. But the truth is, everyone could be better. Nobody is perfect. Nobody can be all things at all times. So I guess that is that is the lesson there. Just, um, you know, if you're feeling jealous, you feel like you don't measure up to other people. Just remind yourself that actually you do have some good qualities, um, but you can't have every every good quality that there is. Um, yeah, try to remember and be grateful for what good qualities that you do have rather than thinking about. Yeah, rather than wishing you had ones that you don't have and, and getting lost in that. OK, so now that we've talked about strengths and weaknesses um, with regards to the uh, seven dwarves, um, let's direct the discussion towards ourselves. So now I'd like you to reflect on yourself, um, thinking what you like about yourself, like what your strengths are, what you think you're good at, things you've done that you're proud of, perhaps, and also on what you dislike about yourself. Maybe some things that you think you don't do so well, areas that could be improved, things you've done that you're not proud of. And just spend a couple of minutes, so just pause the video, spend a couple of minutes writing down some things into two lists. Ideally making the list of the things that you like about yourself a little bit longer than the list of the things you dislike. Because let's stay positive here, let's think positively about ourselves. And once you've written down those lists, you can... You can share them with the people around you and just have a little bit of a discussion and see you, know, you might be surprised and um, yeah, you might be surprised to see what people um, actually think about themselves. And you might also be surprised to, to realize, you know, how many, how many good qualities you do have that you often overlook. So yeah, spend a couple of minutes just, um, just doing that and hopefully yeah, you can get to, you can come to a greater understanding of the own attitudes and beliefs you hold towards yourself. Okay, now that we've, now that you've hopefully discussed some strengths, um, some good qualities, and some weaknesses and areas for improvement um, in yourself, uh, let's take a closer look at you know, your strengths and your qualities and the things you like about yourself, and consider them a little bit further. So here's a couple of questions for you. Firstly, is appreciating our talents and good qualities always a good thing? What, what do you think? Pause the video, have a chat, have a think, write down your answer if you'd like to. 
And let's also consider the difference between confidence and arrogance. You know, how would you how would you characterize the difference between someone that's confident and someone that's arrogant? If you'd like to you know, explore this further, you could do a little role play and you know have a have a little conversation where you know, one of you one of you acts um, in an arrogant way, um, just speaking to a normal person. Then the other person can act in a confident way, speak to a normal person. And then you can start to unpick the differences between confidence and arrogance. Um, and if you don't know the meaning of these words, um, I would suggest you, well, you, you could look them up for a definition if you'd like, um, or I'll, I, I will explain them in a moment as well. Um, but so, yeah, well, my, my opinion on uh, you know, whether we should appreciate our talents and good qualities um, is that you know, we definitely should. I think I think that's always a good thing to to recognize what your strengths are, what your good qualities are. Um, but it's just how far you take that. Um, and that defines whether you know, these good qualities can make you more confident or whether they can make you arrogant. So now let's explore the difference between confidence and arrogance a little bit further. Okay, so a man who is arrogant might say, these people are going to love me. He is, he is certain um, that he is a very lovable, affable, charismatic guy. And there's, there's, no one, there's no one that could possibly view him in any other way. The confidence says, I don't know if these people are going to like me or not, but it doesn't bother me too much. I know I can be happy whatever happens. So I feel like confidence is a little bit more realistic. You, know, you, you can't know whether someone's going to like you or not, but a confident person realizes you know, that isn't the end of the world. Um, ultimately, whether I'm happy kind of you know, depends, that depends a lot on me, not on this one random person that I'm just meeting for the first time, for example. Whereas arrogance, it's it's sort of it's almost delusional. Um, you don't you don't see reality as it really is, um, because ultimately you have no control over whether someone's going to like you or not, um, and, and you can't say with any certainty whether somebody does whether somebody will like you um, and, until you've met them and you know you've spoken to them for a bit. You won't really have a good idea, I don't think. So yeah, I think that um, this kind of this kind of idea is the, you know, it captures the um, the difference between arrogance and confidence. I'd say another thing I'd quickly say about arrogance versus confidence as well is that arrogance has this idea of being better than other people and looking down on other people because I have this and that quality, I must be better and more valuable than this other person. Whereas confidence is like, yes, I have this good quality, but it doesn't mean I'm better than anyone else. It's just, you know, I, I'm good at writing or I'm good at painting, whatever it is you're good at. And that doesn't mean that people that aren't good at writing and aren't good at painting are worse people than you. Um, so that's another difference. But now let's look at, let's, let, let's discuss um, our weaknesses a little bit more and the attitudes we can have towards our weaknesses. So the attitudes towards so yeah, us realizing our strengths can you know, give us confidence or sometimes this can you know, go too far and become arrogance. Um, and there's a similar thing going on when we consider our weaknesses. So sometimes when we think of our weaker qualities, we can really criticize ourselves a lot and, and that can make us feel really bad. You know, you say, oh, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I'm not very good at talking to people. People don't like me. You, know, you might have all of these like nasty things you say to yourself. But is criticism a bad thing? Do you think ultimately talking to yourself in this way might encourage you to become better? Or is it just creating the spiral of negativity and um, feeling bad and feeling unconfident? So you can pause the video, have a bit of a discussion amongst yourselves about that, or write down your answers and thoughts. So I think 
there are different kinds of criticism. So it's not that criticism itself is a bad thing, it's how we do it. So criticism can be constructive as opposed to being purely negative. What constructive criticism means is that when you're criticizing yourself, or, or, or well, you can criticize yourself, you can give constructive criticism to yourself or to, to anything. And when the criticism is constructive, it is um, offering a way that that bad thing or that weakness can be improved. It's saying, OK, this isn't very good, but let's think about changing this and this. And then maybe we will actually have something that is quite good. Um, whereas, you know, purely negative criticism would just say this is really bad. You know, don't bother, don't bother with this. Just just throw it away. You know, th this painting is awful. But constructive criticism says, you know, I, I don't particularly like it at the moment, but I think there's some changes you could make, you know, maybe make this shade of green paint a little bit darker, um, maybe add some more detail to the eyes, and then you'll have quite a nice painting. So here's an example of you know, constructive criticism versus pure negativity. So I'll read them both out and you can decide based on what I've just said, um, which you think is which. So on the left here, we've got this this boy who's um, just done a test, I think, and he says, I failed the test. I'm so stupid. And this boy on the right, he also um, failed the test and has just done the test. Uh, and this is what he has to say. I didn't prepare very well for the test. And as a result, I did quite badly. Next time I will do more preparation. So. Which of these is constructive? Which of these suggests a way that this bad outcome can be improved in the future? So clearly uh, it's the boy on the right. This is constructive criticism. This is negativity. So this boy over here, he's being purely negative. You know, he, he thinks he failed the test because he's stupid, but actually maybe he didn't do very much work and, and, that, and that's something he could improve on. So that's constructive. Um, you know, this boy is saying, I can do more work um, because actually I failed because I was badly prepared, not because I was stupid or, um, you know, it wasn't due to any like lack of intelligence on, on, on his behalf. Another consideration that we have to make when we are evaluating ourselves and looking at our strengths, looking at our weaknesses, is that everything is relative. Um, and so what that means is we have to be careful who we are comparing ourselves to, because if I compare myself to an Olympic athlete, I might tell myself, you know what, I'm, I'm not very fit. I'm not very good at sport, but I'm comparing myself to an Olympic athlete. Or if I compare myself to a chess grandmaster, I might tell myself, mm, I'm not very good at chess. Or if I compare myself to a supermodel, it's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not very good looking. But really, this is all relative. And actually, I might be quite good at chess. I might be quite sporty and I might be quite good looking. But yeah, this is this is all a matter of perspective. It's who you compare yourself to. If I compare myself to a goblin or an orc from Lord of the Rings, then I'm extremely good looking. So yeah, it's all relative. So when would we describe somebody as clever? What makes somebody clever? And again, you can take your own time to think about this and answer the questions um, by discussing amongst yourselves or writing them down. And this is quite useful to explore your own thoughts. So when would we describe someone as clever? So a person is clever if most people are less intelligent than they are. You know, how we define IQ um, you know, the intelligence quotient, that is based on an average. So we're always comparing ourselves to other people when we're saying, I'm clever, I'm stupid. When might we describe a person as stupid? Well, this sort of follows the same idea as the question above. A person is stupid if most people are more intelligent than they are. But actually, you know, they might still be they might still be quite clever. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, um, all humans are extremely intelligent. 
you know, comparing ourselves to you know, our evolutionary past, for example. Uh, this um, idea of everything being relative is also also brings to mind uh, a famous a famous quote, uh, which is that the one eyed man is king in the land of the blind. So we would consider a man with one eye, you know, to have a vision that is less good than most people. So we would say that this one eyed man, he can't see very well. He's only got one eye. But in a kingdom where nobody has any eyes, the one eyed man has exceptionally good vision. He's the only one that can see, in fact. So I guess the lesson here is yeah, be careful who you're, who you're comparing yourself to. Maybe you think that you are stupid, um, but you might be, you might be surrounded by um, you know, very gifted students. You might be in a, yeah, in a classroom full of very, very intelligent individuals. And so that doesn't make you stupid. To um, really drive home this point of relativity, um, I want you to answer these following questions. Well, actually, this question up here. So would you say that this here is a, is a big fish? What do you think? Maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's let's, let, let's say for argument's sake, this is a medium sized fish. What about this fish, though? This fish. If this is a medium sized fish, then this fish must be pretty big, right? It's almost three times as big, I'd say. So we've got this pretty big fish here. Wow. And, and now here we've got, we've got an enormous fish. This fish looks about three times bigger than this fish. But this was apparently a big fish, but it doesn't look big anymore. Now this is the big fish. And now, you know, this medium sized fish is looking absolutely tiny. This is now looking like a tiny fish. And this is a big fish. This is a medium fish. This is a small fish. But is this really a big fish? No, it's not. There's, there's always a bigger fish, it seems. So, yeah, this is the, this is the idea of, of relativity. You know, when, when would we call a fish big? When would we call someone clever? When would we call someone stupid? It depends who you're comparing yourself to. If you compare this fish to, you know, the fish at the start, the fish at the start looks absolutely tiny. But I could have done this slide in reverse. I could have started with that fish and gone smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So really it's hard to, yeah, it, 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 it's all relative is my point. Okay, so this lesson so far, we've talked about comparing ourselves to others a lot. So before we move on from um, this idea of comparing ourselves to others, let's just consolidate what we've learned and what we've discussed. So what bad things can result when we compare ourselves to others? Pause the video if you'd like and write down your answers and this will help yeah, establish your learning. So what bad things can result when we compare ourselves to others? So as we discussed earlier, you might feel sad or jealous and we may become arrogant. And this will cause us to act badly uh, towards other people. Um, you know, arrogant people aren't very nice. You know, people that act out of jealousy also do terrible things. Or out of envy, um, perhaps, is a better word than jealousy in this instance. But what good things can result when we compare ourselves to others? So, we can learn from others how to do things better. Let's say someone's really, really hardworking and organized. You could go and talk to that person and ask, well, how, how do you organize yourself so well? How do you organize your work? How do you stay motivated? So you know, when we compare ourselves to others and think, hmm, I'm not very hardworking, but they really, really are. There's an opportunity there to learn something from someone. And on the flip side of this, uh, we can also serve as an example for others. So others can learn from our strengths and we can help others um, get better at what we're already good at. So we can all help each other out. 
So when we compare ourselves to others, we have to remember that we're all different and that ultimately is a good thing. We are all different with something unique to contribute towards the world. You know, this coral reef here, uh, this ocean scene wouldn't be as beautiful uh, if it was just a hundred of these fish or a hundred of the turtles or just lots and lots of this coral here. It's the, it's the variety that makes it so beautiful. And I think people are like that. So it's all, it's all such a blessing. Um, we're all so lucky that we live in a world um, of such varied people with different talents, uh, different skills, different ideas. So now it's time for a little bit more self-reflection. Earlier, I asked you to write down your strengths and your weaknesses, and we've since discussed you know, how those strengths and how contemplating those strengths and weaknesses can make us feel, i.e. confident or arrogant. Um, and then or when it comes to our weaknesses, you know, perhaps that can make us feel negative or it can um, inspire us and give us opportunities to improve. So now that we've discussed all of those things, what do you think about the attitudes and opinions that you have towards yourself? Are they always healthy and productive? So what I mean by this is, you know, if you're if you're thinking about one of your weaknesses, um, are you thinking negatively or are you thinking in a way that is constructive? Um, you know, do you become do you become arrogant uh, when you contemplate your strengths? Do you ever get jealous of others? All of that kind of thing, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so if you could just write down whether you think your attitudes and opinions are as good as they could be or whether there's room for improvement and if so, how. I'll give you a minute. Well, you can pause the video and give yourself a little bit of time to do that. And then discuss amongst yourselves if there's more than one of you. So the attitudes that we have towards our own strengths and weaknesses and successes and failures um, can manifest itself, can be expressed in how we talk to ourselves. So the way that we talk to ourselves, the thoughts we think can be quite revealing of, of our attitudes um, yeah, towards our own strengths, weaknesses, successes and failures. So one um, aspect of self-talk or how we talk to ourselves that I'd like you to consider now is which of these um, thoughts here is more constructive? So it's could versus should. And the boy on the left is saying, I should have done better in the test. So it's the boy from earlier. Uh, and then in a parallel universe, uh, the boy is saying, I could have done better in the test. So which of these sentences is more constructive and positive in your opinion and why? Justify your opinion if you do have one. So I think the more constructive and more positive sentence or thought is definitely this one on the right here. So I could have done better in the test because could um, has a sense of possibility to it. It's like I, I could have done this. Um, whereas should has a sense of, oh, I didn't do it and therefore I'm bad. Um, but could is like, oh yeah, you could have. It's um, not putting as much pressure on yourself. Whereas should have done better is um, yeah, maybe more restricting. Um, so yeah, when you're talking to yourself, when, you, um, when you're having thoughts in your head, maybe remind yourself to say could have instead of should have. So rather than saying, oh, I really shouldn't have said that, that maybe looks so stupid. You could say, I could have said something different which would have been better. So it's about framing things in a positive way. So do you think that how we talk to ourselves might be linked in any way to how we talk to other people? So often what we say about others we actually think about ourselves. So we recognize our own strengths and weaknesses in others. 
So if we don't talk very nicely to ourselves, chances are we don't talk very nicely to other people either. Um, so looking at, at these two uh, scenes here, you've got a scene on the right where a boy is poking, poking another boy in the chest and saying, you're a cowardly wimp, which means you know, you're, you're afraid, um, you're timid, you're worthless, kind of, um, is what he's saying. Um, whereas over here, this girl is saying to this other girl, you're very kind. So, you know, bearing in mind the link between how we talk to ourselves and how we talk to others, you know, which of this boy on the right and, well, yeah, which of this boy over here on the left and this girl on the right, which of these two speaks to themselves in a kinder and more positive way, do you think? And I will let you think about that. I think I think the answer is, uh, I've probably already given you the answer, so I won't say it outright. So finally, before we go into the debriefing and the conclusions uh, at the end of the lesson, I want to leave you with a quite positive note, which is you know, if you don't like what you see in the mirror, remember that you are part of the universe and it literally wouldn't be the same without you. So this idea was put quite nicely by a German man called Eckhart Tolle, or Eckhart Tolle. Um, you are the universe expressing itself as a human for a little while. And so we're all like one of those beautiful, colourful fish in the coral reef scene that I showed you earlier. Um, we're, all, we're all unique and we're all part of something very, very wonderful. So some final thoughts to leave you with um, following our discussion this lesson. So everybody is unique with their own set of strengths and weaknesses, including you. So that means it's okay to have weaknesses because everyone has them. Um, and in that sense, everybody is imperfect. So nobody is perfect. This perfect person doesn't exist. So don't hold yourself to this standard of perfection, which is impossible to attain. So let's forgive each other and also ourselves for our imperfections and our weaknesses. And at the same time, let's learn from each other's strengths. So when you compare yourself to others and see that someone's better than you, don't be disheartened and think, oh, I'm so bad. Think this is an opportunity to learn how to be better. And finally, a nice thing to think about is how you can maybe improve the lives of others as well. Um, so not only can you improve your own life by you know, um, seeing the strengths of others, being inspired and learning how to be better, but you can also set an example for others. They may look to you and they may look at your strengths and think, wow, I want to be more like, I want to be more like you. Um, so what kind of example are you setting for others? Do you think you set a good example? Would you like to set a better example? How would that make you feel if people were looking, looking to you for inspiration and ideas as to how to be a better person? I think being a role model for others would be, would be a fantastic thing. So this is now, this has now brought us to the end of the lesson. Um, thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you got something out of this and I hope you have a nice day. Thank you very much.